Приветствую вас на конференции IT Non-Stop. Сегодня у нас с вами четыре доклада. Между ними кофе-брейки. В соседнем зале развлечения вас будут ждать. А к вечеру у нас пройдет два турнира от наших партнеров. Один по пинг-понгу, поэтому если вы любите, записывайтесь обязательно. И второй по кикеру. Конечно же, на стенде, на самом ярком э, стенде от компании DataArt в том зале проводится много разных активностей, за которые можно получать подарки. Как водится, после каждого доклада спикер э, будет выбирать лучшие вопросы зала и тоже дарить подарок от э, конференции. Я вам желаю прекрасно провести время. Ведущие сегодня у нас... Дмитрий Куперман и Егор Волков. И сейчас я передаю слово Анне Розовой. Она координатор этой конференции во всех странах. Она расскажет нам немножко о проекте самом. Рада всех видеть. Я приехала из Петербурга. И расскажу вам пару слов о том, что такое IT Non-Stop. IT Non-Stop — это серия международных конференций. И компания DataArt, в которой мы с коллегами работаем, проводит их в Украине, Польше и России. Главный принцип конференции — case after case. Это означает, что все Докладчики рассказывают о конкретных проектах. Сегодня у нас в Киеве Java Craft. И давайте начнем. Передаю слово давайте Дени. я еще скажу пару слов о том, что нас ждет именно сегодня, почему Java Craft и что под этим подразумевается. Ну, очевидно, Java. Java прежде всего интерпрайзная. И мы будем разбирать различные аспекты написания enterprise приложений опять же, кейсы, подходы методики и так далее. Хедлайнером нашим сегодня будет Питер Лори, Java Champion, автор и ведущий блога Vanilla Java, респондер на Stack Overflow совершенно фантастический, человек, который, которого нам удалось поймать за день фактически до конференции Java One Сан-Франциско, куда он улетит прямо от нас отсюда. В общем, нам всем, я считаю, повезло, что мы поймали э, Питера, и он согласился нам рассказывать сегодня. Так что будет интересно, будет интерпрайзно, э, нелегко, тем и здорово. За сим давайте пригласим, собственно, сюда Питера. Питер, let's... Let me introduce you first. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to be here. It's a really lovely city you have, and um, everyone's been showing me around, which has been great. Um, I guess it also helps if you have really good weather. Yes, as mentioned, my name is Peter Laurie, and uh, I'm Java champion. I've been working in uh, finance, um, high-performance finance area for about nine years now. Uh, I've worked for a couple of hedge funds and quite a few investment banks in London. Um, a few investment banks in the US as well. Um, I have over 12,000 answers for Java on Stack Overflow, uh, which is actually the most of anyone in the world. And um, I have quite a few gold badges, um, many of which I'm the only holder, um, which means that I, I, I take that to mean I have a very interesting bent on things like arrays, memory, file, I.O., and strings, because they're the only ones. Um, this is my first computer. Um, very cool. Yes, it had eight-inch drives, which hold, held a whole megabyte, whereas most floppies then only held a, um, about a third of a megabyte. And it had two of them, which was even better. I mean, you had to swap them around quite so often. Um, the other thing that's interesting to note is that it had 128 kilobytes of memory which um, is now um, what most CPUs have on their CPU caches inside the, the processor. Okay, so um, where do microservices come from? Where does a lot of the concepts come from? And one of the early principles is called the Unix principle. The Unix principle is about doing uh, little functions that can easily be stitched together to make um, a much more complex function. So you might do an ls, for example, and then a grep, and then something that reads those files, and then something that might pretty print the result. And you can chain them all together just by using pipes in between. Um, there was also stage event-driven architecture, which was largely academic, partly because it was very much server-focused. Um, 
uh, and uh, so it was an interesting thing. We, we, I actually used it in a project, but I don't think it got wide acceptance. By comparison, service-orientated architecture was very widely used from about the 90s onwards, and that was because it came out of the web space. In the web space, um, there's a lot more demand for work and a lot more demand for interaction between clients and servers. So it's very much more of a client-server um, orientated architecture. Whereas microservices are starting to become more of a server-to-server -server orientated architecture. Um, then there's also a Lambda architecture, which is a very simple form of a service, like the simplest form you can have. And um, I advocate using Lambda architecture wherever you can. However, um, because it is so simple, it's only useful in certain situations. And last but not least, um, an area um, which is getting more prominence is reactive streams um, that will actually have an interface um, in Java 9 called Flow. It's been added to the concurrency library. And um, so we will we'll see more use of reactive streams in the future, I believe. So um, in the web space, one of the key principles of around performance is that it's the performance to the end user which matters. So uh, a user um, will judge how quickly a page loads or um, the work is done based on their experience. And um, humans, fortunately, um, are quite slow compared to computers. So you can do a lot of work in that time and still uh, present to the user something that looks quite quick. So one of the um, uh, limits to what a human can see is actually around 40 milliseconds. Now, if you go to see a movie, each of the, um, each of the frames of, of that movie are around 24 frames a second, which is about 40 milliseconds. Now, you couldn't quite happily watch a movie without noticing each frame changing. Um, apparently, in the Guinness Book of Records, there are actually people that can see the screen updating. That's, um, they have much um, more sensitivity to rapid changes. But for most people, 40 milliseconds is a lower threshold. Now, um, a lot of web pages are actually even slower than this because, in fact, in general, the user is willing to wait a bit longer than that. But even if you've got the most ambitious users, 40 milliseconds is beyond the threshold at which they can physically see, so anything faster than that probably um, is irrelevant. So what has happened is that as technology has advanced and you've got um, faster networks and faster computers, because you've got this natural lower threshold as to how quickly a page should load, um, the, the pages have got richer, more detail, more advertising, more images, movies, much more content is being delivered to the user. So what's happened over time is that the web, average web page is getting bigger and bigger. And to the point where um, around uh, about this year, the average web page size is, is as large as the game Doom, the entire game, which was 2.4 megabytes. So there's actually a lot of content being delivered to users. No, but that's um, a choice. Right? You choose to deliver that much information because that adds to the user's experience. Uh, in fact, what um, some websites do is when they have a very high demand, they will cut down the website rather than beef up their infrastructure. So they will have what is a cut down version of their website. So uh, for example, when the Super Bowl occurred last year, um, they had a number of companies had advertising and they expected to get huge spike in demand after that ad was viewed on the Super Bowl. So what they did was they stripped down their web page to just the bits that ran really fast. And they were able to handle up to four times as much load just by just cutting out some of all these niceties. So they just delivered the minimum content. And then after the Super Bowl was over, they, they brought the page back up again with full content. Now, um, certainly in fintech, um, there's a lot of skepticism around um, uh, microservices, partly because it's a buzzword. And in certain industries, they're less um, likely to go for buzzwords than others. However, 
really all microservices is, is trying to bring together best practices. So they're taking service oriented architecture, which is a very big bubble of lots of different things, and they're cutting out what they think is best practice from those. This means that microservices actually means different things to different projects. And this is because um, people have taken different subsets and said, well, this is our version of microservices. And um, so there is a certain amount of tolerance to take what makes sense for you. So you don't feel like, oh, well, I, I, don't, I don't want to use Docker, or I do want to use Docker. Um, and um, you're not forced down a particular road because the whole point is you use what makes sense for your projects. So an initial reaction to microservices is often, well, this sounds like marketing hype. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, then they start to dig into it and they say, well, actually, this seems pretty familiar. Um, seems to be what we've been doing all along. Um, and then you sort of say, well, actually, what we can do is if we want to say that we're doing microservices, all we have to do is rebrand what we were doing anyway. Um, so it's not really much, but it, we, you know, people ask us about microservices and say, yeah, we're doing microservices. We've been doing it for years. Because that's probably true, because actually a lot of the practices you will have already been doing. However, at the point at where it starts to really mean something is you say, well, yeah, we've been doing it for years, but actually there's some good ideas out there around microservices that we could adopt in a very selective fashion. And um, last but not least, you might say, well, actually, instead of adopting some small changes, there's actually some really cool tools to do one piece of functionality or one particular aspect of microservices that we can use to just replace it because it's been designed with microservices in mind. So this is an exercise I went through with one of my clients in, the, in London. Um, we identified a number of best practices which were important to them. And then we looked at, well, how are they doing today? You know, where, where do they see themselves in terms of whether they've been doing this or not, uh, whether they understand it. And um, so the today is basically just rebranding. It's not really changing anything. However, they sort of say, well, actually, with some small tweaks, we could really improve in those areas, minimum effort or risk, but we get some benefit out of it. So that's where the quick wins came from. And last but not least, um, they can say, well, with a bit of a commitment and um, going in an um, investment in time, we could, in six months' time, improve in these aspects. And that gave them a roadmap for improving. Now, one of the areas which often, uh, particularly from the web space, isn't emphasized enough is um, uh, transparent messaging. So in the web space, it, it, you tend to take it for granted that you've got things like HTML or XML or JSON. And they're, they're, they're not easy to read, but you can read them right, with, with a little bit of practice. It's not too hard to pick up what those messages are saying. Um, coming from the fintech world, the, the messages are far more cryptic. They're much harder to work out. They don't make a lot of sense. Um, for example, in the FIX protocol, if you want to create a new order, part of that message has to say 35 equals D. Why? I don't know. It's just, just that's the code that you have to put in. Um, so um, it's... Uh, so even though transparent messaging is not emphasized as much in the web space, it's, it is something that I think should get more attention. Um, the reason this is particularly interesting for you is switching to HTTP2. Because HTTP2 is promising to bring performance improvements, but by using binary protocols. And the problem with binary protocols is you need to have a very good tool set so you can actually see what it's doing, um, be able to decode those messages yourself, so you can visually check um, what's, what's happening. Um, so you need to have um, um, something that could convert it to a human-readable form that makes sense to you. So what are the benefits of microservices that trading systems don't have? Uh, the shorter time to market, easier to maintain, easy to break up into, un into units that can be understood, um, and a number of existing techniques for deploying, like established techniques. 
On the flip side, um, trading systems have actually been developing server-to-server -server communication for about at least 20 years now. Um, the first automated server-to-server -server communication started in about the mid-90s. Um, and that's because, and part of the reason they needed this independent deployability was that they didn't have multiple teams within a company. They actually had multiple companies talking to each other. And if you've got 20 companies, and each one of those companies has got 100 clients, the idea of upgrading everything at once is just not practical. So one of the key things of microservices is the independent deployability. And um, sort of built into the requirements that they've always needed independent deployability, which is something that's relatively new to microservices. The other thing is, from a performance and testing point of view, um, asynchronous messaging uh, really helps, uh, as opposed to synchronous messaging, which is a more traditional style of web pages. And uh, by having asynchronous messaging, you can reduce the impact of latency. You can achieve much higher throughputs for the latency that you have because you can be sending lots of messages before you've even got the replies back. And um, that can boost um, the throughput by as much as an order of magnitude. So what is low latency? Um, in a lot of these systems, um, people talk about low latency, but really um, that, that, doesn't, that has a very broad definition. Um, um, so I've, I've attempted to define it here in terms of you, whether you have a system where you have a view on what uh, impact to the business a slow application would be. Right? So if you don't even have a, a particular view, it may not be concrete or measurable, but at least you have a view that if, you, if your system runs slow, then that will impact your business or your client's business. Um, but um, and in particular, uh, where it gets interesting from a technical point of view is when you start caring about latencies you can't see. And particularly with microservices, this is going to start happening to you. Because instead of having one web page where you get data from a few websites, you will actually be getting data from maybe 100 microservices. And those microservices may depend on other microservices. So while the a whole web page might take 100 milliseconds, now, each one of those microservices can't take more than about a millisecond, right? Because otherwise, your accumulated latency just gets far too high. So, is that, and um, so a lot of people have attempted to take microservices using standard web technologies like REST and then found it hasn't performed. And then they've said, well, we couldn't get microservices to work, we'll go back to using a monolith. But that's not really necessarily the answer, because you can achieve very high uh, throughput and low latency even when you have a very large number of messages, because um, the techniques already exist for much faster communication. It's just that you've never needed it before, not in the web space anyway. So to give you an example, we have a fix engine, which was delivered to a, a bank, an investment bank, a big American one. And the worst one in a hundred thousandth latency. So five nines. That's very unusual for them to specify a five nines. It was too slow for them. It was 450 microseconds. So less than a half of a millisecond, one in a hundred thousand times. That was much too high for them. So um, it, we, we managed to figure out what the problem was. But we needed to use a tool to measure our own application to see whether it was responding fast enough. So this is one of the key differences. You cannot visually see whether your application is fast enough or not. You need to have tools to test it to tell you, is it perf performing correctly? It's not just monitoring um, in production. You are actually test. It's part of your test cycle and development cycle. You need to be able to check the performance of your components. So um, we created a tool, which we open sourced. Um, and then we were able to drop the, this worst um, one, one 100,000 down to 35 microseconds. So it's, it's very good for, for that kind of percentile. So where do trading systems and microservices overlap? Um, simple component-based design is essential. Um, you, these components need to be uh, business components, not just pieces of infrastructure. 
and they also, in other words, they need to be components that come from a business requirement, not um, something you feel you need to build something else on top of. Um, they should also be named, so they need to be addressable in some way. That might be via a service registry, that might be via some sort of lookup, um, so that you can get uh, from that name to how do I connect or use this service. Um, another key area which is becoming more important is asynchronous messaging. So in the web space, the most common uh, protocol for asynchronous messaging is WebSockets. So um, you will probably see more use of WebSockets for getting continuous streaming data, for um, interconnections between servers that can um, stream um, data in a much more efficient manner. Um, uh, another key area is private data sets. Now this will be a big challenge in a lot of organizations because private data sets um, mean you do no, no longer have this Uber database that has everything in it anymore. The reason for advocating that is that each service has its own schema in a microservice, which means that if you need to change the schema of, for a particular microservice, you can just go ahead and do that. The only one you're impacting is yourself. Right? That means you make much more sensible choices. You don't have to interact with five other teams so that you can change your schema because they've been accessing it. Or even worse, what tends to happen once a database has been around for a while is you'll have 30 services, 10 of which you've got no idea who's responsible for them. Or maybe no one is, they're just, they're running. And no one, those teams don't have any development resources. So you've got very little chance of getting those applications updated. So you're kind of locked into a schema which no longer makes sense for you but because um, you, can't, you, you just cannot change it anymore. So one of the key things that they um, recommend for microservices is that each uh, service has its own database schema. And uh, if you want to access that, you do it via the web service itself or the microservice itself. That way the microservice can control um, compatibility and um, work out um, what it needs to do, but it, it owns its own data set. So that's done for independent deployability for each team to be able to use their own choice of database. So one might use MongoDB, one might use Oracle, one might use um, some other database. Um, but it's up to that team to decide what is the best for them for their use case and what they're doing. Now, um, however, a lot of traditional data sets, you've got lots of web services all sharing the same database, and um, that will change the nature of access to that. So Oracle, for example, have got a big announcement next week on how they're going to handle that, because that um, fundamentally changes the way people will use their, their most valuable product, which is the Oracle database. Lambda functions. Lambda functions, um, they are very simple, which is the, their beauty, which is they, uh, the simplest one is you have a, a, an ever-growing list of events coming in. You have a function that just transforms that message, so it might be transforming it from XML into your standard internal data structure, for example. Um, and um, it has no state. That's the simplest form. It's very easy to test, very easy to reason out, out, very easy to replace. Um, the problem is that um, a lot of things don't fit into this category, so um, you can use it. You should use it as much as you can, but it doesn't always suit. So, one um, modification to this is that have a private data store for that function. Now, it's not just mutable state; it actually should be dependent on all of the inputs it's ever received. So by making it dependent on all the inputs it's ever received, instead of being a function of the latest message, it's a function of every message. And that way you can build much more complex stateful components. Uh, then you can chain them together. And by chaining them together, you can go through a series of processes and do it in a very efficient manner and um, uh, have lots of easy to test components because each of these components can be tested standalone. You don't have to, you can, you can test them all in isolation, which means you can develop them in isolation, you can have different teams developing them even. Uh, 
Now, um, sometimes what happens is you've got um, interactions which are quite slow. So this is your critical path. This is the, the most essential things that your application has to do. Um, it needs to get from one end to the other as quickly as possible. You don't want to perform any blocking operations. So um, Node.js does this, for example, where if you have to perform a blocking operation, you pass it off to a background thread. In trading systems, this might be a strategy running on a different thread, maybe in a different process, or even on a different machine. Um, in your case, this might be a database access, because you have to go to a database to extract some additional information. And by extracting additional information, you're um, able to um, uh, do that without blocking your critical application. Now, how, how fast can you get it from one end to the other? Well, some, some of our clients, they're getting it around 25 microseconds end to end. We'll probably never need that. But the point is, this sort of architecture can go very fast, probably faster than you will ever need. And then from a testing point of view, one of the key aspects of this is that you can still test your control system in isolation because all of the results you got from databases are inputs. So these are all the inputs to this control system. So if you need a bit of a date, something from a database, you send a request out that says, I want some, some more information from a database. You, this background task gets it and then packages it up and puts it back in as a message. So by replaying these messages, you can replay what you knew when you knew it and thus recreate all the state that was available to you in production in a test system or on a PC. Even if you don't have access to that production database or you don't have access to what was that production database like at the moment you asked for it. And that gives you very good replayability and reconstruction of your what is effectively now a state machine. So one of the Another reason for using private data is not just deployment and development, but actually performance. If you've got a small enough data set that can fit in your L1 or L2 caches of your CPU, then you will get significant speed up and significant scalability improvements. So um, if you access your L1 cache, which is quite small, 32 kilobytes, then it takes about three clock cycles, which is about a nanosecond. However, by the time you get to level two, uh, or more importantly, level three, it's 10 to 20 times lower. And it's actually worse than that because these uh, caches are private, but your L3 cache is shared. So the more time you can spend in your, in your top level cache, the faster your code will run. And it can run two to five times faster just by staying in your uh, top level cache. But as we get more and more cores on our servers, each core means that now you've got more threads trying to sh use the same L3 cache, because this is shared. So if you've got 20 cores, then the impact of going through and hitting L3 is not 10 to 20 times, it's actually a bit more like 200 to 400 times more expensive. It's a huge, huge difference. So you can get a massive improvements by just reducing the amount of memory each thread needs to do its processing. And this comes down to private data sets, which is a principle of microservices. So far from, um, a lot of people have suggested that microservices are great, but they're slower. But if actually done right, they can be faster, would be my main point you get from this talk. So um, at the lowest level in training systems, you tend to treat a computer as a distributed system in itself. So you think of each of the cores as a computer. It has a high-speed connection to each of the other cores. But in reality, um, private data access is much faster than trying to access data from another core. So say you've got an application that might be laid out like this. In a more traditional sense, this would be the center would be your enterprise service bus. Um, each, each of these um, services might have some data local to them, and they all communicate by this bus. So here, you've got a CPU. This is an eight-core CPU. Um, you've got four cores across the top and four cores across the bottom. These cores have these local L2 caches, 
And this bit in the middle is your L3 shared cache. It's big, um, but it's shared. So um, how would you map one to the other? Well, actually, in training systems, this is what we do. We actually lay out our services and say which core we want them to run on. And then we make sure the data sets are small enough to fit into the L2 caches. And now these services can communicate very fast. Um, the sort of time frame it, gets from, it takes to get from, say, this thread to that one and then back again can be between 50 and 80 nanoseconds. Right? Very short. And this, this is in Java, by the way. I'm not talking about C. I'm talking about Java. Right? So um, as a result, you can now um, get very high performance, but a lot of that is from adhering to microservice principles, not by saying, well, microservice is slow. When we have to, we're going to cheat and do something else. But in fact, sticking to microservice principles can actually enhance the performance if it's done right. So one of the challenges of microservices is testing and debugging. The reason is that if, if you, um, in, in testing, you go ahead and say, all right, I've got all these microservices. They're running all these web containers. I've got to start them all up and shut them all down and, and run all these tests. If I want to do unit tests, I have to start up and shut down all these containers. Um, it's a good idea to do that, but that's more of a complex integration test. And it doesn't help your development lifecycle if this takes several minutes. Every, every minute it takes to do a redeployment, it's slowing down your development lifecycle and lengthening it out. It's more likely you're going to get distracted, more likely you're going to walk away and get a coffee while your build is running, um, which means your productivity goes down. So this is one of the challenges of microservices. Um, the way that I would deal with that is actually say, well, microservices isn't working for you here. So let's go back to how would you do this in a monolith? And then in Monolith, you would actually just wire these components together. You would run them in a test, unit test. Can we do that? Well, I would say yes. Because the way I see a microservice is it's a business component or a named business component and a transport, which allows you distributed access to that business component. So uh, I have an example here where you start with two interfaces. One interface is all the messages coming in. The other interface of the message is going out. Um, we have a data structure, which is your data transfer object. Uh, we have a library called, um, which has got um, one superclass which implements all the other methods, like two string hash code equals. It does a very efficient manner. Um, and all you have to define is all the fields. But that's not quite so important. What's more important is that you fact that you've got a data transfer object which describes your message. And in this case, we um, naturally dump um, to YAML. We favor YAML over JSON because it's designed to be more human readable and it has in, in built-in support for types. And types means that you can serialize objects, not just transfer data. Um, because we're serializing in the two string, so this two string, actually, this is the serialized output, which means we can take the two string of any object and then deserialize it and recreate the original object. So no information is lost. If we log this object, we just copy and paste from the log into a unit test, and hey presto, we've recreated our complex data structure. So let's have a look at this. Um, this is a stateful Lambda product. So we have a class that implements an interface. It takes another interface, which is where all the output's going to go. And it has some state for keeping track of the previous prices. This is accumulating prices from different sites, whether it's bid or ask, and that produces a top of book. But what's important is that you have state, um, and then you make a decision, you decide whether to publish or not. So messages are coming in, messages are going out. But you can notice that I haven't talked about the transport. There's no annotations. There's no, I'm not sort of saying, is this REST or JSON? It doesn't matter. We're testing the functionality of the business component first and independent to how am I going to get this across the wire. And by taking all that out, my unit test is much simpler. All I have to do, with this is with EasyMock. I specify the events I'm going to get out after it's processed. 
I create my component that's going to deliver a result to my listener, which is here. And then I inject some events, and then check that I got all the results I expected. By doing that, um, I've now tested the business functionality without any transport. And not surprisingly, this is very fast to start and stop. We're talking milliseconds. So we can have hundreds of these tests starting and stopping different components, different scenarios, and they will do it in a fraction of a second. Now, where it starts to get interesting is where you have multiple components. How do I do an integration test between multiple services? Well, the main thing is I don't have a, uh, any kind of transport between them. Um, this component, which we just saw, just calls through to an order manager, which in turn calls through to a mock listener. So I've created now um, uh, a number of events going in. This one actually triggers a result. And when I wrote this test, uh, it was broken. Two results came out. So I had to figure out which one it was. So what it did was I just, it turned out it was this one, or this one, I can't remember, this one. And I just stepped into the code with the debugger. I traced what went into one event, then it went into the next component, and then I traced back again, right? Nice and simple. I could see exactly how my services were interacting and why they were creating the events they were. Um, now, once you have business components that work and you've tested them together, then you can think about adding a transport. A transport is not, is not um, something absolutely necessary for testing purposes, but it is important for production. Because in production, you're expected to deploy these components, possibly at different machines. So then you need a, a means of these components to talk to each other. So obvious choice is REST uh, or HTTP. Um, for some reason, I've got WebSockets missing from there, but WebSockets is another choice for um, asynchronous. In Java, you've got things like JMS, Acker, and MPI. More recently, you've got things like Aaron, which is a high-performance um, distributed messaging solution using UDP. Um, the main advantage of UDP is the ability to broadcast. You can send one message out once, and it'll go to a 1,000 machines. Right? So it's got huge fan out. Whereas in TCP, if you've got 1,000 machines, you have to send 1,000 packets to send one to each box. So it doesn't scale as well. UDP can scale extraordinarily well. Um, but if you don't need that scalability, it may not be uh, so useful. Um, last but not least is a Chronicle Q, which is um, what I wrote. So therefore, I know more about it. Um, so that's what appears an example. But obviously, this is a methodology I'm showing you. It's not a product. It's not a framework. You can use these techniques regardless of what technology you're, you're um, using. So in this case, I make sure that the message is transparent. So this is less of a challenge for you guys. But um, in this case, um, I write out this message. And this is what actually goes in the queue. Uh, this is a dump of what's in the queue. It's a more efficient form. It's in binary in reality. But when you dump it out, it just looks like this. So that's an important thing. Don't give that up. Right? So a lot of people are getting excited about binary. And we use binary, but you really need to be able to convert it easily back into text because you will see bugs that don't show up in unit tests very easily. Um, there, there are issues that come up that you do not see just from unit tests, uh, because they do things you don't predict. Um, another area, which another tool which is very useful is a profiler. Now, a lot of people use profilers when they have a performance issue, which is a sensible use case. But in fact, profilers are very useful just for getting a different view of your application. And um, the number of times I've been to clients and I've run the profiler, and one of the biggest consumers was exception. And you go, uh, why is it creating all these exceptions? Well, actually, there's a component in there that's throwing an exception, and then something's catching it as a workaround and then consuming it. So it doesn't appear in the logs. But in fact, there's something that's fundamentally broken. All the tests are passing but still something is broken. And you didn't see that until you used a profiler, get a different view of your application, and say, now you can say, well, why is it creating one application I had? It was creating 22 singletons, 22 instances of a singleton. And it wasn't a performance issue. It wasn't throwing any tests. But something was fundamentally wrong that I had so many 
uh, instance of a class that should have only been one. Right? So that only showed up in a profile. So I'm actually going to move on to uh, a demo. But uh, So this is what a dump of that test was. The test you saw before um, with all of the events actually dumps out like this. And uh, as I mentioned, the readability of your data set is, is key. So don't give that away. So the sort of performance for that test um, is 99% of the time, it's under 10 microseconds to do that test with the persistence, with all the messaging between different processes. So one of the things that's different about this product is that um, we avoid flow control. Now, flow control is a very important feature of, of messaging solutions. Uh, in particular, when you're writing messages to a GUI, you don't want to be pushing too many messages to them. You want it that if the client can't keep up or it's getting too many messages, you push back, you produce less messages. Um, a human cannot keep up, and it, it's undesirable to, to be delivering too much data. Even if the computer can keep up, the human cannot. So you have to be sympathetic to what humans can do. However, there are also systems which are more upstream where you have to consume data and you can't push back. Right? So you as a consumer, you want this massive buffer. So that's where um, something like Chronicle Q comes in. So market data, for example, you cannot tell an exchange to slow down if you can't keep up. If you can't keep up, they'll just kick you off because they can't afford you to slow down any other consumer. Um, and also in compliance systems, you want a massive buffer so that you're not slowing down anyone else's system um, by recording lots of information. So in summary, microservices doesn't mean that you're going to now do everything differently. Everything's going to change, and there's going to be all this risk, and we don't know if it's going to work, and we're going to radically do things uh, differently. If you're doing things too radically differently, it will not work. Um, a lot of people have tried to switch from monoliths to microservices in one big bang, and then it's failed, and they've had to go back to monoliths. Um, instead, what you should be thinking is, how can I change how I do a little bit differently, to step in the right direction, to use these techniques, um, and you will get uh, much more likely to be successful. Um, you introduce the best practices that are appropriate to you. Don't attempt to adopt them all at once. You will not get them all right. Um, whereas if you identify which ones would make the most benefit, stick with those two or three of them, I would suggest initially, not all of them at once, then um, you, you can, in the next iteration, adopt some more. It's very likely that you will be doing some of these best practices already, which is a real advantage. It means that you, again, won't need to change as much as you might think. Um, and in trading systems, you can think of it, um, the machine itself as a distributed system, um, particularly when you start to get into things like NUMA regions, so bigger computers which have multiple memory spaces. You really do have to think about, well, these are actually multiple computers with a high-speed bus between them. You, you can't have an application run across multiple NUMA regions, in Java in particular, because of the GC. If the GC has to go across multiple NUMA regions, your um, performance will fall through the floor. It's really quite bad. So yes, it runs, but it doesn't perform. So you want to be able to think of particularly big servers as a series of smaller ones with high-speed connection. And uh, last but not least, uh, try to use Lambda architecture as much as possible. So each of the pieces you can pull out that's just a simple transformation reduces the overall complexity. And those pieces can be easily uh, adapted and replaced. If you'd like to look at the code, um, everything in green is open source. So you can actually read our code for what we do and maybe get some ideas. In particular, you might find this one interesting, which is a low-level access to native memory using unsafe, and it can access massive address spaces. On a Linux box, for example, I can map in 100 terabytes into a JVM. Right? You'll freak out your sysadmins because they'll run top and it'll say 100T. And they go, what's this T? I've never heard of that before. Uh, well, it means terabytes. Um, so 
Um, we also have a, a library which is like JSON, but has some different properties, which allows you to write in a variety of formats. Um, JSON is very fast for some formats and not so fast for others. We've made, tried to make sure all of our formats are very fast. Um, here's the queue that I mentioned before. We also have a key value queue uh, map, which allows you to have key dupes up. It's equivalent to a concurrent map. And again, that's open source. Uh, these are all Apache 2 and free, by the way. And last but not least, there's an engine which allows you to access them all remotely. If you're interested in some of our more c commercial products, I'd be happy to talk to you. But I highly recommend you just start with the free ones. So um, here are some of the examples um, I've got on a, um, my blog. My blog, I've got um, 4 million hits, so quite a lot of views. And all of our open source stuff is available under OpenHFT. So I believe there's a prize for the best question. I don't know what the prize is. Okay. Uh, hello, thank yes. you for the good presentation. When we speak about microservices, we speak that we, have, we can improve per performance by asynchronic, yes. uh, by messaging. But uh, at the moment, we have reactive programming. We have play, fork, play framework, Vertex, a lot of other solutions. And they also give us asynchronic messaging inside yes. of one monolith. So why uh, microservices in this case are, bet are, are better and faster than uh, one monolith with, with, re with reactive paradigm? Um, well, actually, the, I think um, microservices and reactive are, are compatible. Um, it's, it, these are largely just a set of principles. Um, they don't talk so much about how you should pass messages between systems. So you may decide that the best way is to use a more reactive library. But again, these are still uh, asynchronous messages. And um, with non-blocking polling, for example, is a, a key um, technique that they use. Um, but nevertheless, I would still advocate the same structure where you, you have business components you can test in and of themselves without the transport being involved, but then run them with the transport as required. And I think in Scala in particular, they make that pretty easy um, because the, the transport is much more um, transparent. There's not the need for lots of annotations all over the place, for example, to, um, to enable it. So uh, I think this is actually easier to do in something like Scala, for example, than in Java. At the moment, I think in Java 8, it's not so hard also because we have compatible futures. We will have uh, reactive streams in Java 9, so it should be more comfortable in future to work with reactive. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. So as I mentioned on the first slide, I think reactive um, streams will be an essential part. Um, one of the downsides of reactive streams is that you need to have um, a single functional definition in one place of your entire stream, which means that that needs to be deployed at, at once. Um, whereas uh, one of the things they advocate in microservices is that you can have different teams working on different pieces of the functionality. They can be deployed at different times without a shared code base. Um, so you, you're actually breaking the problem up, not just in code, but in your organization to allow uh, teams to work independently. But within those teams, um, using reactive structure makes a lot of sense. It's, it's more what happens when you want to have multiple teams working independently that uh, microservices really make much more sense. OK, thank you. I have some practical question. We have uh, microservices now, uh, and we ended up with the model itself like fits microservices, but we ended up with a system that uh, sends forth and back uh, big messages, invoices. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like to ask you for your experience, uh, well, fr from your experience, what is the size of your messages? The like best best size or some best practices, uh, and how many remote calls do you did you have uh, in a line like total? Right. Well, so like um, our message size is to keep them really compact. Um, typically, the ones that we measure are as small as forty bytes per message. So they're very small messages. Um, more typically, they might be 100 bytes uh, in finance. Um, greater than about 250 bytes is a big message. Uh, 
but um, you can get much bigger data structures. We have one client, they have two megabyte beta messages, um, which is much more substantial. So um, that's because they serialize from C++ into XML, and that XML contains some fields which are already in XML. So if you want something less efficient and more verbose than XML, you encode XML inside it. That's even more verbose. So like all your double quotes become ampersand double quote, <laughs> for example, so they can escape them out. So you can get some really verbose formats. Um, at this point, it starts to become a question of, is it worth compressing those messages? Um, because they get, um, they get, some of those messages were getting up to 50 to 1 compression ratio because it was so verbose, um, which is enormous. Um, however, we found that with a fast enough network, um, even with 2 megabytes, um, you didn't really need to compress them. Um, the benef what the trade-off is that if you've got such large messages, often they don't get updated that often, like maybe 10, 20, 50 times a second. Um, anything more than that, you're really starting to saturate a number of resources. So certainly, uh, reducing message size will speed things up, for sure. Um, you're writing less data, you're parsing less data. Um, you're often um, doing, making more intelligent processing in the sense that you don't have to reprocess all these fields that perhaps didn't change. So if you can cut down to just the fields that have changed, that will make the message size smaller, but also the amount of processing it has to do is shorter. It also makes it more readable because, say you've got two, two megabyte messages, but only a few fields have changed. When you're trying to work out, well, what changed here, right? Um, you have to do some sort of comparison. Whereas if you're getting the computer to only send what was changed, as a human, you can read it and say, oh, well, these five fields changed, right? Not this massive message. So it can, it can um, make it easier to debug and uh, to trace as well. Uh, but it does take a, a bit of effort. It also m means changing the format, which is not always possible because different teams will have different ideas of what that format should be. And um, that can be tricky. So for, in the case of this client, they did change the format. They reduced the size by a factor of 10 as a result. Um, and um, they, they saw an improvement in the consistency of the performance of the machine as well. Uh, and what about the stack size of remote calls? So, stack uh, size for remote calls. How many did you have in, in your experience? Um, yeah, so uh, one of the problems with frameworks is they tend to add quite, they can add quite a lot of layers in terms of stack size. Um, I, I meant, uh, well, like uh, the first microservice calls another. And oh, right, 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 at the, the high level. Yes. So um, there's no more than a chain of maybe six, generally, uh, of the critical threads, but they're all passing off to all these other sort of side ones. And um, uh, the largest systems I've worked on, they're, they've got hundreds of services. Um, one of them is uh, 1,700 services, and these services are deployed globally, um, and they do different things. So there's, uh, there's a whole lot of boxes in Tokyo, uh, Hong Kong, some in London, some in New York, and they're working on different pieces of data. So if you want to collect together data for the whole world, you actually are contacting services across um, the world. Um, so potentially touching any one of those 1,700. I wouldn't actually advocate that many. Um, it depends on why you're creating, using microservices in the first place. But if it's for scalability of your team's development, then you're, you're going to have a number of microservices that matches roughly the size of your team. It may be the number of teams. You maybe have three to five services per team, or you might have one to three services per developer. But once you get to much more services than that, you're not actually, you, you're not getting the benefit of having so many services because all your team, everyone can work on a separate service at once anyway. Having even more services is just adding more overhead. It's not actually benefiting you as much. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you, Glory, for sharing your experience and knowledge. Thank you for listening. We're really glad to see you and ah, yes. hear you today. Yeah. Yes, and now uh, what, do you, what do you think? What's the best question?
You're here. Um, I think they were all good questions, so I'm going to go for the previous person who asked the question first. The first question. Yes. Thank you so much. Be proactive and give some gifts. Thank you so much. Peter. A pleasure.